good afternoon all um, i'd like to start by thanking dr sarita helawat and the living science team for uh, this uh, opportunity so i'll be talking about uh, an introduction uh, to cryoelectron microscopy which is uh, a technique which has become very popular in the last uh, few years and its potential applications and uh, as the name suggests uh, when we say microscopy we are talking about visualizing uh, magnified images of uh, small uh, material and in this particular case what we would be talking about are uh, biological molecules so which are uh, general proteins protein complexes protein nucleic acid complexes pathogens such as viruses which uh, essentially um, are uh, um, functional units uh, in our body and um, we obviously since these are very small molecules we are talking about uh, an material in the small nanomolar range or even smaller than that for visualizing them we require um, some illumination source with a wavelength at least a million times uh, lower than that of light that a visible light so for this purpose the first electron microscope was uh, developed and uh, it was uh, designed by Ernest Ruska in 1931 and uh, the features of the electron microscope as you can see this is the first uh, uh, microscope that was built and uh, the principles are based on um, some fundamental uh, uh, tenets of physics like accelerated electrons behave like uh, light in vacuum. Uh, but their wavelength is much shorter than that of visible light and they travel in straight lines, they have wave-like properties, etc., etc., and which are all the principles which went into designing of the, of the first electron microscope. Now, when we're talking about biological samples though, electron microscopy and biological samples uh, don't really sort of match. I mean, it's not like a marriage made in heaven. Uh, the reason being that uh, biological samples are primarily made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So we're talking about material which are weak electron scatterers. So it, the images that uh, one obtains are very low contrast and it's very difficult to say what you're looking at. Additionally, biological samples are very prone to radiation damage and also to maintain uh, this ultra high or for the biological samples to sustain themselves at the ultra high vacuum which exists within electron microscopes is also very difficult. So we're talking about a challenging problem how to combine electron microscopy with biological samples and visualize them at high contrast. So you can see these are some of the earliest images of uh, electron microscopy images of biological samples. These are virus particles, but all that you can say is that uh, these are kind of spherical or uh, hexagonal particles without uh, being able to tell any detail. Uh, things improved a little bit after the development of the negative staining technique, which is essentially when you drop some heavy metal or incubate your biological sample with a heavy metal solution, which sort of outlines some of the features of, of the sample that one is looking at. So you can see that now in the, in the virus samples, more detail is, is um, available to, to see. Now, uh, but there are certain issues uh, associated with negative staining also. Uh, primarily the issues being that uh, heavy metal can distort the surface of biological macromolecules plus uh, there is a drying step involved so there could be dehydration related changes so overall getting very high resolution features of biological samples using negative staining is, is uh, also difficult to do at this point uh, people were also trying to figure out how to uh, sort of look at these images that are being collected in two dimensions or in 2d and try to generate a volume density in three dimensions or in 3D. And uh, one of the uh, you know, first uh, <clears throat> uh, kind of work in this field was by David DeRosier and Aaron Klug, who looked at the bacterial or could reconstruct the bacteriophage T4 tail structure uh, from 2D electron micrographs. And also another seminal work in this field was carried out by uh, Henderson and Nigel Unwin, 
who looked at the structure of bacterial rhodopsin, uh, which is the light harvesting complex in bacterial membranes. Uh, so they generated this 3D volume density from 2D uh, crystals at uh, seven angstrom resolution. And this is again to show you, um, this is the first structure of a virus. Uh, this is tomato bushy stunt virus, which was reconstructed from, uh, again, 2D images by uh, Tony Crowther in 1971. So uh, all of this excellent work uh, could, uh, could go to, to take 2D images to a 3D reconstruction. However, they still could not solve this uh, problem of uh, radiation damage to biological samples. And also the question was how to get very high resolution structures and how to preserve them in kind of a native environment. In native environment means aqueous environment without addition of any like heavy metal or negative stain. So this problem was addressed by Jacques Dubochet and colleagues. And for this work, Jacques Dubochet was one of the co-recipients of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry Award last year. So uh, they developed uh, a technique called plunge freezing, which essentially uh, what it does is that it preserves biological samples in amorphous ice. So this method involves <coughs> generating uh, very quick uh, very quickly plunge freezing biological samples so that it's suspended in amorphous ice and so that none of the features are distorted and the samples can then be visualized using an electron microscope. <clears throat> so um, the difference essentially between negative stain and this method of uh, quick plunge freezing or vitrification is that while negative stain just gives you the surface features of the biological molecule, the vitrification or cryo-EM preserves the surface features and preserves the uh, biological molecule or particle, so to speak, in a close, as close to native environment as possible. So Jacques Dubochet was the person who put cryo in cryo-electron microscopy. So using this fundamental technique, um, the basic workflow for cryo-electron microscopy was, uh, was established, which we still use to this day, which is essentially that one has a, a sort of a, a support or a, a holy carbon grid, uh, which is a small uh, circle of about three millimeter. And it can be of various types. There can be a carbon coating, there can be a gold grid, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the sample that one is going to use. And on the surface of this, uh, of this grid, which is glow discharged or made hydrophilic, uh, one adds the sample. And very little sample is required, which is one of the advantages of cryo-electron microscopy. And I'll come to that later. Now, um, the sample that is put on the surface of the grid, about 99% of that is removed by uh, sort of blotting the grid with uh, filter papers and the very thin layer of sample remains on the surface of the grid. Now this very thin layer along with the grid is quick frozen by drip, uh, dropping this uh, uh, grid into liquid ethane, which is being cooled by liquid nitrogen. And this sort of preserves the sample in whatever orientation it was in the, in the aqua solution or in its native environment in, um, in this amorphous or vitreous ice. So to look at it a little bit closely, this is uh, a grid which is being held by, by tweezers and the sample is added on the, on the grid. And then this entire uh, setup is put inside a, a vitrification robot. Now there are several kinds of vitrification robots that are available. And uh, what the robot does is that it maintains a certain temperature, certain humidity, and also it very quickly plunge freezes the sample. And uh, the sample is then quickly uh, sort of uh, dropped in liquid ethane, which is being cooled by liquid nitrogen, very low temperature, minus 190 degrees. And quick cooling is the, is the key to this. And uh, this results um, in the formation of the sample, uh, the vitrified sample which is then put inside the electron microscope. Now this shows a, a standard or uh, at this point relatively old fashioned side entry uh, uh, microscope. And your grid goes in there and it's being continuously cooled uh, by uh, nitro liquid nitrogen coming from a dewar. And uh, then this is visualized in the electron microscope. So as you uh, increase, as one increases the magnification, 
so gradually the the you know the features of the grid become visible so this consists of grid many grid squares and in each grid square there are these holes where the sample has uh, vitrified or is sort of suspended in amorphous ice now what uh, what has happened here now once one tries to uh, once one starts to uh, sort of image these uh, biological samples that are that are vitrified um, what one would see is this um, you know whatever sample whatever biological molecule was being uh, looked at so it is present in different orientations in in the sample and this is a very important concept different orientations are necessary and then we get uh, we collect images of different orientations of the particle now, one issue that comes in microscopy always, and definitely in cryo-electron microscopy, because the contrast is very low, there are many other issues, uh, you never get a perfect image. Your image is never a perfect representation of the object. This is because electron microscopes, like other microscopes, uh, is prone to various types of aberrations, like spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, astigmatism. Also, there may be drift um, in the environment, in the instrument, there could be a problem with the source, there could be instability. So all in all, in addition to the low contrast of the sample, again, there are some corrections which need to be done in order to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, to negate some of, these, um, some of these issues which occur with image generation. So um, all of these factors together, issues with the microscope is uh, termed as point spread function or PSF and essentially the image that uh, one generates is a convolution of the object Fourier transform with the PSF. So that is uh, the image and so several corrections have to be applied to the image before it can be processed further. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very iterative process. Um, and this whole uh, process to now take the 2D images and generate a 3D density volume is termed as single particle analysis or SPA or single particle deconstruction. So essentially this involves uh, picking of the particle. So you have to sort of all the uh, images of the biological macromolecules which are there in, in uh, the micrographs have to be collected they have to be subjected to some kind of uh, contrast transfer estimation and correction. And then there is a, a whole computational method or pipeline to take these images and to generate uh, a 3D uh, structure of the biological macromolecule. Now here there was a, a, a significant contribution from another, or another Nobel laureate who also received the uh, prize for cryo-electron microscopy in 2017, which is Joachim Frank. So Joachim Frank and colleagues like Marine Van Heel figured out how to uh, take these images and process them. And these are sort of, if one works with non-periodic uh, material without a lot of internal symmetry, how to get a 3D structure from these, um, these images. So uh, essentially what is done is that it's, it's very important that the material or the biological molecule is in a random orientation. So all of these random orientations or, uh, uh, or images are captured and these are then sorted into subsets. So here there is application of multivariate statistical analysis to sort these uh, hit, like sort of uh, different uh, looks or orientations of the of the particle into various subsets and to generate class averages which are then um, aligned and an initial model is generated which is taken into 3D reconstruction and refinement. So there are several methods once one gets these 2D classes and these 2D classes essentially represent one particular orientation of the, uh, of the biological molecule that, that one is looking at. So if you can see here, these are all different orientations of the same molecule. So one could be looking uh, through the top portion or the bottom portion of the molecule. One could be a side view. But the idea is that you need a lot of orientations in order to get a good reconstruction. Now, there are various methods for generating a, a 3D model. Uh, there's random conical tilt method, common lines method, 
icosahedron reconstruction, which are typically used for virus particles. Because virus particles have a lot of symmetry. So, so one orientation may have many other like common orientations. One orientation may be similar to many other orientations. And then helical reconstruction, which are all different methods for reconstruction. But essentially, what a reconstruction uh, would do, or what is the basis of a basic of a reconstruction, is that all of these images that we collect are 2D projections of the particle in different orientations. Now, once you collect these 2D projections, you stack similar projections in one stack, in different stacks essentially. And uh, that improves the signal to noise ratio. So, because the signal to noise ratio is very, very weak, we are looking at unstained samples. So, um, essentially, if we take many different iterations of one orientation, that would improve the signal and reduce the noise. Now, once you have these uh, stacks, then <coughs> these uh, projections of the calculated Fourier transforms can be made to fill the central section of the Fourier transform of the 3D structure. And once you do an inverse Fourier transform, you get the 3D density map back, essentially. So the more projections you have, the better it is. If a particular biological molecule is in a preferred orientation, for example, you can only see the side view, you cannot see the top view, then reaching high resolution or getting a good 3D reconstruction is, is a difficult challenge. Now, once one generates these uh, 3D uh, structures, the next question is how would you figure out resolution? Resolution is a big question in structural biology or, you know, the most important factor because the better the resolution, the more detail of the biological macromolecule one can see. So in case of cryo-electron microscopy, we take, the, we take the data set, and this is also a procedure that was proposed by Joachim Frank, that you take the... Uh, um, the data set and randomly divide into two and then calculate the Fourier ter terms of the two halves and sort of compare them to each other. And the FSC at 0.5 is the cutoff. This is where you say this is the resolution of the, of the molecule. It could be, you know, 3 angstrom, it could be 10 angstrom, it could be 25 angstrom, depending on how good the images were to begin with and how good the reconstruction technique is. So to show this to you sort of pictorially, these are the micrographs or the images, and one typically collects about thousands uh, of these micrographs. And these contain images of the biological molecule, all in different orientations, as you can see. And then one sort of picks these particles. Now, this is a method which can be done in an automated fashion or manually. And uh, once you pick uh, these particles, then they are stacked in uh, similar orientations are stacked together. And then one generates an initial 3D model, uh, sort of refines the uh, angular projection values and improves the model. And finally, after refinement, you get a nice 3D volume density of the macromolecule that one is working with. Now, there are, uh, there are many different, obviously, you understand that this is a very intense computational method after collecting the data. And there are many softwares uh, which are uh, utilized to, uh, to solve 3D structures from 2D images. But uh, this uh, process, like up to, let's say, 2010 or 2012, upon using this workflow and getting these images and trying to get 3D structures, it was still difficult to sort of go to crystallographic resolution. So the predominant structural biology technique is X-ray crystallography, which routinely generates structures at a resolution of, let's say, 2.5 angstrom or 2 angstrom. However, cryonium could generate, let's say, 3 to 3.5 angstrom structures of molecules with a very high symmetry, like viruses, for example. But it was very challenging to get below 3 angstrom for most molecules, so it was quite impossible. And so uh, this technique was termed blobology, or the study of blobs, because the struct structures that one would get were essentially blobs, and it was very hard to sort of see detailed features of, of the macromolecule. But uh, this is where <coughs> the theoretical calculation said that reaching below 3 angstrom should be possible uh, with only 12,000 uh, something particles 
if all the information from the object can be transferred to the image. So this is where the challenge was. And this is where uh, Richard Henderson and colleagues uh, came in because they, uh, they uh, developed uh, these um, detectors called direct electron detectors, which were a departure from CCD cameras, which had been used up to 2012 or so. Now, CCD cameras uh, carry out multi-stage conversion of electrons which are transmitted through a sample. Now, they are converted to photons. So, there is some information loss along the way. What direct electron detectors do is that they use CMOS technology and they register incoming electrons directly so that there is no information loss. That is one very important aspect. The other important aspect is that uh, the images are collected in movie mode. Now, this is important to understand because uh, what happens is when electron beams hit a particular area in the grid, there is some movement. The movement could be in the nanometer range, but the movement causes blurriness in the image. Now, DEDs allow collection of images in movie mode, so you can collect several frames for one particular image, and then you can correct for this motion and you can get better images where you know the blurriness can be reduced. So to give you an example, uh, on the uh, on this side, panel A is uh, not corrected or the image is not corrected for, uh, for motion. And here after correction, you can see that the features are much better visible. So the direct electron development of direct uh, detectors, as well as other uh, methods, such as availability of face plates, which improve the contrast, as well as uh, in-column filters within the microscopes, really led to what is uh, termed as the resolution revolution in cryo-electron microscopy. And this is just an overview of resolution revolution. This is the same structure of a protein called beta-galactosidase. So in 2005, the structure was solved at 25 angstrom. And this is blobology because what you can see is essentially a blob. You can tell what is the overall shape of the molecule, but you really cannot say that uh, visualize the, the you know finer details of the of the protein. Now in 2011, the same structure was solved at 11 angstrom. In 2013, at 6 angstrom. In 2014, at 3.8 angstrom, and then in 2015, at 2.2 angstrom. So as you can see, the features are becoming more and more defined as the resolution is improving. And then finally, in the 2.2 angstrom structure you can basically understand individual side chains of each amino acid and you can fit it directly in the density. And so this is sort of crystallography standard where you can solve the structure of a molecule without first having to crystallize that molecule. <clears throat> so this uh, sort of revolution has uh, converted cryo-electron microscopy from a niche technique or blobology to a technique which will lead to the generation of very high resolution structures. And also prim primarily initially it was uh, sort of limited to very large molecules. So unless you have a large virus or a protein complex which is above let's say 300 kD, it was very difficult to sort of visualize that, that uh, molecule using electron micro microscopy. But now with the improvement in the technique, one can look at uh, you know, large protein complexes like adenovirus, um, the ribosome, but also smaller proteins like uh, isocytoid dehydrogenase, which is a 93 uh, KDA protein molecule. Uh, the highest resolution structure solved up to this point is glutamate dehydrogenase. It is solved at 1.8 angstrom. And then uh, the latest uh, small uh, protein molecule uh, structure is that of hemoglobin which is a 64 KDA uh, protein, and I think you're all familiar with hemoglobin. Now, in, in 2017, uh, the, the structure was reported, and it was possible to visualize it and solve the structure at uh, fairly high resolution, <coughs> at 3.6 angstrom resolution, and uh, very uh, detailed, uh, a good uh, amount of detail was visible um, of, the, of the molecule. So this is sort of the, the revolution that I was talking about, that without going into extra crystallography, trying to um, 
crystallize a protein molecule and trying to reconstruct a structure from diffraction pattern, one can directly visualize the molecules and collect images and try to get a 3D structure. And it is applicable at this point to lower molecular weight proteins and it is possible to get high resolution. Another related technique uh, to single particle analysis or reconstruction is cryo-electron tomography, which looks at molecules in situ. Now, when we are talking about all these biological macromolecules, they have been purified from their native environment, and we are looking at them in vitro, meaning we are looking at them in a tube. They are not in their natural environment. Cryo-electron tomography helps uh, people look at uh, protein molecules or macromolecules or enzymes or uh, viruses, etc., in their native environment within cells. Now, what this involves is that uh, <coughs> sectioning of thick uh, material. No, now, here we are not talking about individual protein molecules or individual viruses. We're talking about a whole cell which needs to be sectioned into very, very thin sections. And then the sample has to be tilted because here we are not talking about random orientation, so you need to tilt the uh, material in order to capture orientations. And there is again a, a workflow where the material is first frozen and then either subjected to vitreous sectioning or it is thinned by using focused ion beam milling and it is visualized uh, in an electron microscope and reconstruction is done from the, the images from there. So this is an example where uh, within a, a whole cell, people are looking for a, a complex, a 26 proteasome molecule, which exists in various states. So ground state or substrate processing state. And the various states can be picked from these uh, tomograms or sub, by subtomogram averaging. And then reconstructions can be done of these molecules which exist in their natural environment within cells. So now cryo-electron microscopy, um, one can either go for single particle analysis, which is that you purify your protein of interest, you have a random orientation, you freeze the protein molecules or uh, whatever uh, you know, particles that you're working with, and the random orientations from 2D images can be reconstructed to a 3D density volume. Another option is that you can go directly to cells in order to do in situ structure determination the cells are thinly sliced and then they are rotated typically uh, through plus minus 60 or plus minus 70 degrees in microscopes. And then the uh, sort of sections are aligned and from there a reconstruction of, of uh, your uh, material of interest can be carried out. And this is where actually machine learning and neural networking comes in, where uh, for identification of this material within cells, people are using neural networking or machine learning techniques which uh, is actually um, <coughs> helping uh, quite significantly in, in such reconstructions. So uh, from my initial image that I saw, showed of virus particles without any features to the point where we can get very high resolution structures of uh, even small protein molecules, the challenges over the years have been to reduce radiation damage to the biological molecules, to improve the instrumentation, to uh, reduce drift, uh, make the sources more coherent, get detectors with high um, detective quantum efficiency or DQE so that a lot of detail can be transferred to the image. And uh, the challenge is also in the computational uh, part of the work, how to you know, sort of uh, process uh, 60,000 or 70,000 such uh, particles uh, or noisy images to generate good 3D reconstructions and faster algorithms, obviously, for analysis and reconstruction. So where we have come up to, uh, up to this point is that development of plunge freezing has started off cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, we have been able to develop uh, very, uh, very efficient microscopes with good uh, detectors with high DQE. And uh, advances in GPU has resulted in improvements in, in the computational part so that it is possible to process a large data set and get a structure in a limited amount of time. So uh, cryo-electron microscopy was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2017, as I've been mentioning. 
And these are the three pioneers who, who were awarded Jacques Dubouchet, who developed the plunge freezing technique. So what does the future hold for private chemicals? So even better, faster detectors with 100% decuming if possible, stable face plates which can lead to uh, images with high contrast, automated sample preparation method because the sample preparation method still is uh, is fairly manual and it requires a lot of user skills. Uh, faster algorithms going to in, v in, um, in C2 protein structures from in vitro protein structures. And uh, this is an expensive technique, I, I didn't go into that, but the, uh, uh, the uh, instrumentation and associated um, other requirements are fairly uh, cost intensive. So how to reduce the entry cost of cryem and hopefully in future more Nobel Prizes. So here the question is, so again, what is the advantage of this? We've talked about a method, a technique. Uh, which would provide high resolution structure of biological macromolecules. Why is that necessary? Why should anybody care? Why can't we just go with X-ray crystallography, which is a very well defined method? Um, the reason being um, this method, so we relate biological structures to function. We think that if we know the high or the high resolution details of a molecule, we should be able to at least predict what would be the functionality of that molecule. Or we should be able to address the functionality, alter the functionality, particularly in disease states. So drug development also requires understanding the, the high resolution structures of biological molecules. And um, also when we're talking about pathogens, for example, when Zika virus suddenly you know, came back, uh, the structure of the virus was solved very quickly using cryo-electron microscopy. That's the structure that you see in, in green and blue over there. So the, the knowledge of the structure is necessary for us to develop vaccines or to develop drugs. Now, where cryo-electron microscopy helps the process is that one can reach high resolution structures with a very small quantity of starting material compared to other techniques like crystallography. And this is a fairly fast technique if you have the setup and uh, operator skills and user uh, and all other requirements. But if all of these things are in place, then a high resolution structure can essentially be solved in weeks or days. And even heterogeneous samples are, are okay. So uh, for X-ray crystallography, one needs perfectly homogeneous samples. For cryo-electron microscopy, with the availability of good 2D uh, 2D image uh, separation processing techniques, it is possible to deal with heterogeneous material and even get a good uh, high resolution 3D structure. So given all of these advantages and the requirement uh, for understanding biological processes by looking at uh, high resolution structures of macromolecules for drug development needs, etc., I think this technique is here to stay and with the um, with the improvements or the current uh, very um, high resolution methods that are available, this is going to become a primary technique in drug development or in structure function studies in future. So with this I'll end and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention.